Welcome to this webinar, Perspectives on Faith-Based Approaches to Tackling Gender-Based Violence in the Pacific, co-organized by World Vision Australia, World Vision Vanuatu, Anglican Overseas Aid, and Uniting World. My name is Sarah Steyer. I am the Senior Evidence and Learning Gender Advisor at World Vision Australia and a co-organizer of this event. Through the ACFID Gender Equality Community of Practice, this joint webinar presents an opportunity for local faith and development actors and their respective Australian partners to reflect on the relevance, experience, and impact of ongoing faith-based approaches to tackle gender-based violence in the Pacific, with a particular focus on intimate partner and family violence, as well as perspectives on gender programming within a faith network. We are thrilled to have close to 100 participants in this webinar representing NGOs, government, and research institutions. Our region has some of the highest reported levels of violence against women and girls in the world. According to a UNFPA Asia Pacific Regional Snapshot, the proportion of women who have reported experiencing physical or sexual violence by an intimate partner in their lifetime ranges from 15% in Japan and Laos to 68% in Kiribati and Papua New Guinea. In Vanuatu, where the three presenters will focus particular attention, three in five women or 60% of women who have ever been in a relationship have experienced either physical or sexual violence or both by a husband or intimate partner. Across the region, patriarchal systems and beliefs and norms promote and reinforce male dominance and often underpin justifications of violence against women. They are deeply entrenched and internalized by women and men alike. Religious norms and customary interpretations of religious texts, primarily Christian, are often used to perpetuate and justify violence against women and to reinforce harmful gender norms that marginalize and subordinate women within their families and communities. Religion, the lens of for this webinar, is a strongly salient identity in communities across the region. In most Pacific Island countries, over 90% of the population is Christian, with religion an important part of people's everyday life. Faith leaders are among the most influential and trusted members in many communities in the region. According to RDI's guidance on how to collaborate with Pacific churches for development research, there is increasing recognition among development and humanitarian agencies, practitioners and scholars, that the church is a significant civil society player and has the potential to be an influential voice, challenging adverse social and cultural norms and promoting human rights. Evaluations of faith-based programming tackling gender-based violence in the region indicate that faith-based responses are particularly well-placed to tackle gender inequality and faith leaders are recognized as having an important role in helping achieve social norm change in development and humanitarian contexts. World Vision, Uniting World, and Anglican Overseas Aid all work with Pacific churches and faith-based organizations and apply faith-based approaches and frameworks to tackle gender-based violence in their communities. Yet there is not one type of faith-based approach. Each approach is unique and operates differently within a larger faith framework. Likewise, while predominantly Christian, there are variations within and across denominations in the region that are critical considerations for gender-based violence programming. During this webinar, we will hear from Belinda Loria from Anglican Overseas Aid and Ethel George from the Anglican Church of Melanesia, who will provide an overview of the role of faith and faith-based actors with a particular focus on humanitarian contexts and the synergy between humanitarian activities and long-term development initiatives with a look at the Ambai volcano response and the redesign of the ANCP Safe Resilient Communities Project. Millie Greaves and Pastor Fiamma Rakao from World Vision Vanuatu will focus on the REACH program, Relationship Education About Choices and Healing in Vanuatu, while also framing it within the larger context of World Vision gender-based violence related programming in the region. And Natasha Holland from Uniting World and Martha Kalwatman from the Presbyterian Church of Vanuatu will focus on the Presbyterian Church in Vanuatu's work in this area and framing it within the larger context of Uniting World's Partnering Women for Change program and gender equality theology across the Pacific. All our featured projects and programs are funded by the Australian government. Please note that World Vision Vanuatu panelists, Ethel George and Martha Kalwatman are all sitting together in World Vision Vanuatu's office in Port Vila. 
<laughs> we will conclude the webinar with considerations for future designs followed by Q&A. Before we begin, we encourage you to use the Q&A function to type in questions throughout the presentations. And please remember to have your microphones mute. I would now like to invite uh, Belinda and Ethel to begin. Hello everyone, I'm Ethel Church from the Anglican Church of uh, Melanesia, or um, ACOM 112. And I am Belinda Lauria, Program Manager, Quality and Compliance at Anglican Overseas Aid. Our presentation today will be drawing on a recent case study from the Arm by Response, an Australian Humanitarian Partnership, or AHP funded humanitarian response, as well as our joint approach to create a stronger synergy between activities and trainings delivered during a humanitarian response with the provision of long-term development initiatives. This will be explained namely through our Australian NGO Corporation Program or ANCP project, Safe Resilient Communities. Faith and the role of faith-based organisations and actors. Local faith actors are frequently core to, the lo to local systems of humanitarian response and community development initiatives. The Anglican Church of Melanesia, or ARCON, that Ethel will explain and give a bit more detail on, was formed in 1861 and has been present in Vanuatu since this time, supporting community response to emergencies for more than 10 years. ARCON utilized extensive volunteer networks and ministries that undertake both church and community development work. Ethel will explain this more with a particular focus on the Anglican Ministry of the Mother's Union. Female volunteers who have been active in Vanuatu for many decades and are members whose members are very involved in community outreach, from literacy to health, to 16 days of activi activism initiatives and women refuges in Solomon Islands, to name a few. They are part of a global network with thousands of volunteer members across the Pacific. Over to you, Ethel. ACOM yeah. Vanuatu is an established grassroots uh, institution in Northern Vanuatu with a strong network of churches, parishes, dioceses, schools, rural training center, and situated across urban and remote areas around all Northern Vanuatu pro provinces. This enables ECOM Vanuatu to have reached into all these areas through existing strong social and community networks underpinned by extensive church membership. ECOM Vanuatu, as well as other church institutions, have a number of ministries like the Mother's Union, plus others that have their own structures and working in parallel with the church's structures in reaching out to the needy and the oppressed on voluntary basis. For ACOM, there are trained Mother's Union volunteers who are actively engaging in the implementation of development projects and programs being coordinated through ACOM. They play a major role in advancing and extending much needed information and skills into other remote communities. Combining all the different church structures and existing networks gives us a picture of how strong the church network could be when properly mobilized for any disaster response or recovery initiative. Focusing on the Ambai recovery, using the existing network would be a more economical exercise in terms of human resource and more realistic in addressing people's needs because they know their surroundings and needs best. Uh, Belinda. There has been growing international recognition of faith-based actors in humanitarian and development action. We know that Pacific churches in particular have high levels of legitimacy and support in their communities and are seen as an essential part of the fabric of their society. 
Churchin are often amongst the first responders in emergencies, drawing on their extensive local resources and understanding of traditional knowledge, leadership and cultures to guide their response. The Charge for Faith-Based Humanitarian Action was endorsed at the World Humanitarian Summit by more than 160 faith-based actors and religious leaders, representing all major faith traditions and different geographical regions. The Charter presents concrete commitments from religious leaders and other humanitarian actors to increase the impact of faith-based actors in reducing humanitarian need and suffering, and to call for their inclusion within policy and decision-making at all levels of humanitarian response. So, how do AOA and ARCOM work together? Locally led approaches. We use existing evidence-based culturally appropriate measures and projects. You'll hear from World Vision Vanuatu on their Channels of Hope or REACH program, as well as from Uniting World and the Presbyterian Church of Vanuatu about the Theology of Gender uh, program. Both of which we, ARCOM and AOA within our ANCP project have leveraged. We've engaged with other faith-based actors and other churches and looked at programs that already exist that are working well and utilize those in our own projects. It's a two-way skill transfer, capa uh, capacity strengthening of the partnership and of each party. It's about creating space and upskilling. AOA's role with all of its church partners is working towards our partners being equipped to connect and capably support the national humanitarian response and longer term development initiatives. AOA works through a strength based approach, recognising the power of holistic community empowerment when, exist, uh, when existing strengths and assets are realised and mobilised. Using a transformative and localised approach, AOA projects are locally led, projects that are strategic and transformative for communities and participants. Positive change towards achieving agreed project objectives will be observed and measured. In particular, you'll hear in more detail about our ANCP funded project. You'll see, you'll also see uh, on the screen at the moment, the diagram, the arrow is, the green arrow is down the bottom. Within our ANCP project, we use a training of trainers model to catalyze change. Key church personnel will become change agents, advocating for vulnerable persons and an end to gender-based violence through the projects I just mentioned. This project leverages existing social networks that Ethel mentioned, namely the Mother's Union, that span to the most remote communities in Torba province. The Anglican church has a very strong presence and depth and reach in Northern Vanuatu. Leaders will be trained first, who will become advocates within the institution of the church. The advocacy will advance from leaders advocating within the church to other clergy to community advocacy. Secondly, church leaders then train community leaders, including youth coordinators and savings with education facilitators. These community leaders then go on to train social network leaders who train their community groups. Social networks who undertake training, which is embedded into their existing community program, are actively involved in the trainings while also witnessing changes in behaviour and practices within their leaders. The same message from diverse sources through multiple mediums, which will more likely to positively influence community members to adopt new behaviours and attitudes regarding gender-based violence. I'll pass it over to Ethel to explain a bit of the redesign process in more detail. Uh, apologies for the delay. It looks like our um, our Vanuatu participants are having some problems with sound. So let's just um, let's just give them a minute.
as I have already mentioned, ECOM Vanuatu is an established grassroots institution in Northern Vanuatu and has strong networks which enables its reach into all these areas. Just a hint of where and when this picture was taken, it was taken at the village in Motalaba, Torba province during our AOA ECOM joint recent redesigning consultation trips to the rural communities in May 2019. ECOM always uses the bottom-up approach through community participation in programming and project designing. It was found out during these consultations that the Mothers Union volunteers who were trained as facilitators have impacted people's lives through our savings with education program. This program provides space for gender equity in a family context where husband and wife both make decisions about how the family money is used or shared. It was also found out that injustice is still experienced in families and communities, including gender-based violence. So the redesign of the project under AOA and ACOM partnership will now be concentrating on impacting health relationships in the next four years. As you can see in the pictures, sorry. As you can see in the pictures, the pictures are self-explanatory. This is an explicit background of how judges and in this case ICOM channeled its programs, including development projects through its structure. As you can see from these pictures, we engage all community members men, women, and children, leaders, and lay people in the project and consult them during the redesign. Customs and beliefs, of course, in Vanuatu shape attitudes to gender equality. Though cultures in Vanuatu vary according to geographical locations, we share a general understanding about gender and roles. This learned behavior has grown roots so strong in our society and became internalized and institutionalized. And the church is no exception to that process. Thus the Bible, especially the creation story and the fall of man plus other related biblical texts would be mis misinterpreted, causing harm, especially to women and girls. Mythologies around femininity and masculinity, so not have also impacted negatively on women's status in the church, especially with regards to women's ordination to priesthood. So with existing strong structures and influence, churches could create change through enabling mind shift. So positive change could happen through positive influence of theology and the church. If all church leaders are convinced and experience the mind shift, then they will share that experience with their congregation, either through preaching or other forms of communication. Not all church leaders are confined to the myths and wrong beliefs, but there are many who still does. Churches don't have all the answers to combat GPP responses, however, they link with existing services and other faith-based organizations. We need to work together more closely and using the right approach and language that is more friendly, receptive, and well accepted by all. Belinda. Thank you, Ethel. I'm now going to focus um, the next short part of the presentation on a AHP activation funded by the Australian government, um, DFAT. Um, a one particular part of the response, um, which was a collaboration, an ecumenical and secular collaborative approach uh, during the humanitarian response. This was a Kandu response to the Ambe volcano crisis. Kandu is a network uh, to explain who Kandu who is. <laughs> um, Kandu is a network of eight Australian church based aid and development agencies. We all, with long established relationships in humanitarian and development programs in the Pacific region. 
each with a local partner who implement the response on the ground. To give you a bit of background, in April 2018, the population of Ambai Island in Vanuatu were permanently resettled to nearby islands due to an active volcano that began spewing torrents of ash and gas from its crater. After some delay, the government of Vanuatu evacuated the entire population, approximately 11,000 people from the island, after declaring a state of emergency. However, many had fled to nearby islands prior to the government's delayed action to the crisis. I am going to play a short clip now. It was a clip used for marketing purposes. It gives you a, a visual of the environment during that time. Volcanic is for 11,000 residents of Ambai to flee the island. On Maywo, where the government wants to resettle the Ambayans, Three and a half thousand evacuees live in tents. This settlement of 30 tents is home to 200 people. The residents here do not know how long they will stay here. The government has said they will buy them land, but they are unsure when that will happen. On Santo, where some 6,000 Ambayans have gone, the situation is not much better. Families crowd dozens to a room in the homes of friends and family. Whole villages spring up in community centres and church grounds. It is spring now, and the people who call these places home have to deal with the sometimes oppressive dry heat. In a few months, the wet season will arrive, and with it, new challenges that these ramshackle settlements will have to tackle. During the Ambai humanitarian response, both ARCOM and AOA with ADRA and ADRA, ADRA Australia and ADRA Vanuatu, um, who were all part of this particular humanitarian response, recognised global good practice for affected communities and staff, acting within a mandate of inclusion and do no harm. This does differ somehow though from some adaptations of customary practices that do cause harm to women and children in the Pacific. Our theological approach and safeguarding entry points to address this challenge connected spiritual well-being to overall well-being for communities, invoking faith as a strength that advocates for equality and justice for all. While there was evidence of short-term transformative behaviours after protection training and support from church partners, longer-term transformation needs sustained and widely adopted behaviour change requiring many diverse messages that are ongoing and interactive. This is where we are now linking this initial work during the response and providing long-term initiatives to sustain the change through long-term development projects through our ANCP project. International actors alongside local actors can provide space that women otherwise would not have been provided women can begin to question social constructs. During our research into localization and women's equality, when writing a paper on this response, the work of sociologist Bordeaux succinctly describes interventions to change oppressive norms. Bordeaux explains that what is taken for granted and appears as a natural order within a community, such as oppressive cultural norms that do not change over time, is due to the lack of choices or possibilities presented or made available to that community. Bordeaux states that such socially accepted injustices can only be questioned, including by women and girls themselves, when a new view is presented that provides choice and enables individuals to question the world order. This approach was applied during this response and also will be in our ANC pre project through prote protection training local faith actors and theologians who use the Bible as the vehicle to advocate for the elevation of safeguarding. Communities were provided with a different interpretation of theology compared to Bible teachings that have been unquestionably accepted for gener generations, namely messages that promoted and sustained harmful societal constraints on women and girls. I'll pass it over to you, Ethel, 
to discuss the leadership on it. I will mention um, a little bit about the Leadership Summit during the AMBA response. The Leadership Summits have proven to be effective mechanism for ecumenical and secular mobilization. For AMBA context, it is not always easy to bring leaders from different denominations together, but the summits showed that mobilization towards a good cause is possible. There were four community-led uh, leadership summits held on the islands of Ambai and Maiwo, involving representatives from community leadership and established interfaith collaborations. Facilitators used theological teachings as an entry point for local faith actors to critically examine the difference between biblical and cultural concepts of protection and inclusion, reflecting on uh, adapted cultural traditions that may inhibit protection. We had the police, World Fission, Adro Vanuatu, who is another faith-based organization from another Christian denomination, Panama province, and uh, the agriculture department from the government. The government worked with the church to disseminate information, skills on roles of uh, disaster committees and committee formation, pastoral care, GPP plus referral pathway, gender and human rights, and also food security plus tools were distributed, and peace building and uh, conflict resolution. Belinda. Thank you, Ethel. The response aimed to strengthen pre existing social support networks that Ethel uh, just explained. So this included church leadership, family structures, and women's groups that provide stability and social cohesion in times of crisis. This was primarily so that communities and families understood the risks and actively prevented children from being exposed to abuse, exploitation, violence, and neglect during displacement and repatriation. Research and anecdotal evidence have shown that most Ni Vanuatu preference bringing private matters to the church to deal to deal with their challenges over speaking with NGOs or other formal institutions, including the courts. The church is seen as a trusted social system compared to other institutions. With this knowledge, church leaders trained in family life matters were utilized to address the gender and protection issues in this response. Being locals themselves with their own personal experience in family life issues, coupled with the professional trainings they received the volunteer church leaders were able to share their own powerful personal experiences with affected communities. The church's influence and trust saw the summits reach approximately 3,850 members of the Ambai population. I will hand it over to Ethel to sum up our presentation and give you her very personal and professional view on the way forward. Thank you, Belinda. To conclude, I think the obvious weakness or maybe challenge for the church in Vanuatu is remaining silent about GBP. There is no collective voice of the church against GBP. We need to tell our leaders that the church cannot continue to remain silent because this is a global issue and it is our national obligation as well to address any human rights violations. The church has to run parallel with the secular world in showing the right way to its people and has to speak out maybe through Vanuatu Council of Churches, which is a non-governmental organization. It is made up of seven member churches, Presbyterian, Catholic, Church of Christ, Apostolic, Anglican Assemblies of God and the Seventh-day Adventists, a peak body for coordination and collaboration for Vanuatu denomination and our ongoing development and humanitarian work. Churches have the strongest structures and with be better mobilization through ecumenical activities such as training with right tools and other upskilling activities, I personally believe that positive changes would happen and people would experience more healthier relationships and more justice would prevail in communities 
where there would be more balance in power beginning in the home. I would like to stress here that to me, there is no problem with our culture. It is the myths and wrong beliefs that needs to be addressed by the church. Thank you, Tamar. Thank you very much, Ethel and Belinda. I'd now like to hand over to Millie and Pastor Fiamma. Hi, uh, my name is Millie. I am the Senior Program Manager of World Vision Vanuatu's Gender-Based Violence Prevention Program, REACH. And I'm here with Pastor Fiamma. I am uh, I'm the faith and education mentor here in World Vision Vanuatu. So I'll start with just giving a brief history of the REACH program. So REACH, or Relationship Education About Choices and Healing, uses the Channels of Hope model. Channels of Hope is a World Vision international model which mobilises community leaders, especially faith leaders, to respond to core issues in the community with specific programming targeting HIV, child protection, and maternal and child health, we in Vanuatu use the child, uh, Channels of Hope for Gender to address gender equality and GBV. Channels of Hope for Gender explores gender identity norms and values that impact male and female relationships in families and communities. Channels of Hope has been implemented in 59 plus countries, including in Australia in some communities in, of Northern Territory and Queensland and has also been adapted for the Quran. World Vision Vanuatu's GBV program started in 2014 with a regional ANCP project with World Vision Solomon Islands and World Vision Timor-Leste and followed a traditional channels of hope for gender approach. By 2016, each of these three countries had adapted to better fit our context. While still using the channels of hope methodology of faith leaders being champions for change in their communities. World Vision Vanuatu developed new content and activities to meet the specific needs of leaders as community level service providers, including a stronger integration of traditional chiefly structures and spouses of faith and community leaders as core participants. We also produce content and curriculum in Bislama, the main local language. Since 2018, the program has shifted again uh, towards a stronger focus of a whole of community approach, which the diagram depicts, meaning more community members become direct participants in World Vision Vanuatu's programming. While continuing to maintain strong relationships and mentor faith and community leaders to model behaviour and drive change at the community level, World Vision is currently working with over 10 different denominations in this project. Before Pastor Fiamma takes us through what the faith-based approach means for us in a more practical sense. I'll go over the types of activities we implement in communities and congregations so you can get a sense of our operational approach. So to begin with, and on the right-hand side of the screen, you'll see our Goodfellow Life program. Goodfellow Life, or GFL as we call it, uh, means a good life for girls and boys. It's a Sunday and or a Sabbath school curriculum developed to promote gender equality and positive gender norms between girls and boys aged five to 12 years. The curriculum is made up of 17 lessons that are based on simple biblical principles. For example, we are all created equal in the eyes of God with complementary custom stories and activities to reinforce key learning. Sunday and Sabbath school teachers are trained and supported by World Vision Vanuatu staff to deliver the program to children in their congregations using illustrated flip charts as a key teaching aid. And on the left of the screen, you'll see our youth program, which comprises of four key modules to promote online safety and healthy relationships. The program is delivered in a co-facilitation model between World Vision Vanuatu staff and youth facilitators to establish peer-to-peer -peer learning. The program has been delivered with different youth groups, including congregational and church-based groups, sports clubs, and in-school youth. And it also leverages large events such as music festivals, concerts, and sports competitions. This year, we're happy to say we are partnering with FESNAP One, the largest free music festival in the Pacific, to theme a four-day event around healthy relationships and consent. 
Moving on to our secondary prevention approaches, all addressing attitudes, including biblical justifications for violence. We have our reducing family violence workshops, which we used to call counselling skills. This is two one week workshops delivered to male and female adults in the community. This targets uh, including spouses coming together to attend the training to maximise impact. We have our men's behaviour change program, which is a 10 to 11 session small group program for perpetrators of violence. The purpose is to assist men to reduce and cease family and domestic violence. And the program address, does this by addressing attitudes and behaviours around abuse, while creating opportunities for men to understand the impact of their violence on their partners and families. Strategies for stopping violence and sexual respect are some of the topics covered. And it is facilitated by World Vision Vanuatu staff and faith leaders who have received specialist training. Lastly, our mentoring of faith and community leaders through training in gender and GBV and linking with formal service providers is supported with a peer support group program, which is made up of male and female leaders. They meet every six weeks to share and learn from each other, as well as seek support for any challenges they have faced. I'll now pass over to Pastor Fiamma, who will talk more about our faith-based approach. The faith-based approach is appropriate for the final two context. We have already heard from the previous presentation about the faith context in Vanuatu and across the Pacific. But I would like to draw out more how this looks in reality in Vanuatu. We have had 87% 80, of the people of Vanuatu are Christians. And World Vision Vanuatu is a faith-based organization. We attend church regularly. In Vanuatu, people say there are three laws. Law of the government, law of custom, and law of the Bible. The church plays a major role in how people live their lives, connecting them with community and into social structures. Not only is faith an important part of people's daily lives, gender-based violence, intimate partner violence has been encouraged by some faith and custom actors. Let me explain more. Faith and community leaders are the preferred informal service providers. Whenever people come across challenges and problems in life, they would either go and see a community leader or a pastor of a church to help solve their problems. For a community leader to solve a problem, the preferred approach is a cultural reconciliation, meaning that the offender performs a sorry ceremony, usually offering of mats or chicken or yam to the father of the victim, depending on the severity of the violence, and is then allowed to return to his family. This usually happens in the days or weeks after an incident and before any meaningful behavior change has taken place. For a pastor to solve a problem, they would either pray or use the Bible to assist. Prayer is a powerful tool for the victim to find peace and harmony within themselves. However, like the custom approach, it is not addressing the violence itself and by promoting prayer and then family reconciliation, the safety of the women and children are not considered and the behavior of the perpetrator is not changed. In the faith approach, World Fish and Vanuatu provides 10 guiding principles of Bible studies to help address gender problems. The 10 guiding principles are a guide to discussion on gender and what the Bible says about gender-based violence, to have a correct understanding of the Word of God, to show gender equality and positive gender norms are the Word of God. Using passages from Genesis to the book of Ephesians from the Old to the New Testament. We also help faith leaders 
to reinterpret Bible passages that are interpreted to support practices that suppress women and children. And I will give you three examples. The first example is in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23, where the Bible say the husband is the head of the wife. This is culturally interpreted to mean the husband is boss, therefore demand from the wife and children. But the right interpretation is the husband is head as Christ is head, which is more of a servanthood than boss. Secondly, the second example is Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, where the Bible says that wives submit to your husbands. Sometimes people incorrectly think that it is only the wife to submit to the husband. But in verse 21, it says submit to one another before wives submit to your husbands. Therefore, it is a two-way submission. The last example is Proverbs chapter 13, verse 24, where the Bible say, use the rod to discipline your child. The Bible translated to mean stick. The rod is translated to mean stick. And often, sometimes it is used to hit the child. But the proper interpretation is the rod as a shepherd's staff to guide the sheep to safety, but not to hit, hit it. Also in the faith approach, faith and community leaders are trained to address violence in four areas. They are trained to address violence in their personal life, to change their behaviors and attitude, modeling their life after the life of Christ. Secondly, to address violence in their own family, so that within their family there is no violence. And thirdly, to address violence in their own congregation. And lastly, to address violence in their own community. World Vision teach and train faith and community leaders to become champions, to address gender and family violence, teaching faith and community leaders about gender-based violence, including the cycle of violence and behavior change, so they understand the need to put women and children safety first, and don't encourage reconciliation of families before true behavior change has been seen. Faith leaders and community leaders are taught and trained to put the safety of women and children first and to provide appro appropriate safety plans to prevent violence taking place. World Vision Vanuatu provides safety tools to control behaviors such as the, the stop sign, safe time out please, which is shown in the screen. We're now going to show a short video from some of our beneficiaries. Name me Colin Willie. Uh, me one police officer or VMA officer. My same time, my same one uh, chaplain. We look at one of the police force, one of the mobile force, one of the maritime. Mo me work too, me Katsanis, lo attend them all workshop all training, the world vision, especially the men's behavior of change. Yeah, lo look look person look look more view blow me. Also one ni vanuatu. Uh me look him say you make at uh culture, you make at uh church, you make at uh government education, or uh trivial uh element of protocol you make at the life you me. Nation Trivala Yamistap from some belief. Where Emmy Kamodlo, uh, MBC Modulsia. So he may proud them from say, me look say, Emmy make one change. Uh, hello, name Lomi Amanda Tafoa. I got two beginning, mommy one Sunday school teacher over 13 years finish. Me been work with them uh, World Vision Vanuatu and the program for GFL for over two years finish. As me grow up one violent home time in small me grow up become and up. Me lose the GFL, he me one one good program. 
por ejemplo, yo me go back lo past, lo, um, lo culture lo yo me, uh, woman, every time yo me stop lo look down all geta. Full up time yo me no look so ve value blo all kel. Pe chi evel he me come pro teach him, se, no matter se yo me different lo body, pe yo me graded lo image lo papa God, mo girl he me so ve make him walk with boy he me make him, mo boy he me so ve make him, walk with girl he me make him. Uh, you me come pro teach him all geta too, pro look so ve all qualities inside lo all geta. So, bro, all is have a work together, bro, make him say, fan what to blame me, but tomorrow, what am I good for a relationship, and I come good. Name, bro, me pastor Sakaraya. I'm a pastor for 10 years. I'm a work with the Mold Vision and the Low Rich Program. Today, Low Culture, bro, you me, Culture, I look say, man, now, I'm a control and family, bro, him. Instead, lo uh, wife with them, husband of life, uh, share them thing thing. Lo cut one good for a life, good for a family. But uh, uh, it never happened that way from the man he meeting the me now me help lo lo lo, lo family. And um, uh, lo program ya lo rich he me help him uh, me for all leaders lo look say lo look look lo God and we he me create a man with a woman also man helper. A uh, blood flesh have a work together. Blo make him say uh, one family or community or society. Man with them, woman is have a work together no more. Blo make him say uh, uh, is have a cut one good for life. Okay. So that was a little uh, video from our faith, some of our faith uh, champions. Um, moving on to our, our Do No Harm approach. We wanted to touch on this because in Vanuatu, and I think it's probably fair to say across a lot of other countries in the Pacific as well, uh, there's um, uh, a lack of formal service providers. Um, and those that do exist are very overwhelmed in the system. Uh, and to work in gender-based violence, you need to take such stringent approaches to do no harm. So I wanted to touch briefly on how we do that. Um, we create strong partnerships with existing formal service providers. Uh, for us, that means the Vanuatu Women's Centre, the Family Protection Unit at the police. It also is a, a strong relationship with an authorised persons program. The authorised persons program is uh, supported through the Australian government and the government of Vanuatu is uh, leaders in a community who are given uh, the rights to create protection, temporary protection orders uh, in cases of domestic violence. We also have strong partnerships with uh, other partners. So um, as Ethel mentioned before, we work with um, ARCOM in Vanuatu to deliver training to their networks. We provide safety checks for spouses or uh, of the men who go through the men's behaviour change program and the safety checks are connecting the spouses with a faith leader, a female faith leader and a female World Vision staff member before the program commences and at regular intervals during the program and ensuring that they have uh, links to formal service providers as well. We, all of our staff are trained in how to respond to disclosures given the nature of our work. We have IEC materials like the one that's shown on the screen uh, now. It's a basic and simple tool to assist with referrals and make awarenesses on what services are available. Uh, and we mentor faith leaders and community leaders, as Pastor Piyama said, to make sure they're putting the safety of women and children first. I am now going to, to share two considerations on the faith-based approach. Uh, first, on the success side of uh, the faith-based approach. Considering the success side of the faith-based approach, we consider churches as a cornerstone for communities in Vanuatu and in the Pacific, and are therefore important in spreading messages in a meaningful way. Because they are agents to bring changes to people in society through the message of the gospel, and the modeling of the life of Christ. And also they are sustainable. Once doctrine has been adopted, they are embedded into congregations. They own the ideas and messages and continue on with it 
and apply the message to their members. On the restriction side, however, all church denominations are different in structures and functions. They have their own program and activities, making finding a time to come in with activities and workshops challenging. Therefore, we in Wall Fish and Vanuatu have to be flexible and adjust ourselves to working with faith and community leaders in their congregations and communities. It involves lots of hard work outside of working hours in the evenings and on the weekend. We listen to them and create an environment of good partnership of working together to bring change in Vanuatu. And in conclusion, uh, for lesson plan, after piloting the Channel of Hope project, an, an external evaluation was carried out. The results showed that between 2014 to early 2018, 71% of the participants who attended our trainings and workshop, faith and community leaders and their spouses stopped using violence in their home. However, there was little trickle down effect of behavior change to the congregations and communities level. While faith leaders had begun providing appropriate responses and referral to women who experienced violence, there they did not bring the influence and, the, and impact we expected. Therefore, we now consider a long-term approach to go deeper in few communities to have a greater impact on providing more continued support to faith and community leaders and elders to spread messages of change. Thanks very much. Um, just to conclude, we last year uh, did an external evaluation on our reducing family violence workshop, which we used to call counselling skills, uh, and that will be made available to any attendees after the um, webinar is closed. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you, Millie and Pastor Fiamma. I'd now like to hand over to our final panellists, uh, Natasha and Martha. Thank you. Um, so I'm Natasha Holland and I'm the International Programs Manager, I'm an International Programs Manager at Uniting World and um, I'm with Shana Hoffman, uh, the PCD Project Manager. Um, Uniting World is the Overseas Partnerships Agency of the Uniting Church in Australia. Um, we're a relief and development agency and we're accredited with DFAT. Um, similarly to AOA, we work in direct partnership with church partners in, and that's in the Pacific and Asia and Africa. The relationships with many of these partners are decades strong, with some in the Pacific founded on over 100 years of shared history. Our partners know the culture and the context and are already helping communities and we work alongside them to support them to fulfill their vision and implement locally initiated and directed development projects as they seek to address injustices and poverty within their context. In the Pacific, we have, sorry, in the Pacific, we have church partners in Vanuatu, Fiji, Kiribati, PNG, Samoa, Solomon Islands, Tonga, and Tuvalu. And we engage with them all in partnership at some level. Looking at the percentage of the population identifying as Christian, it's not hard to see that churches are an important part of Pacific culture, as it's already been discussed, and play a central role in social change. Um, and it's fair to say that the majority of our partner churches um, the leadership is almost exclusively male, but our partner churches have parallel women's fellowship organisations and in the Pacific, our primary partnerships for development are with these organisations. The Presbyterian Church of Vanuatu is the largest church in Vanuatu. So the Presbyterian Church of Vanuatu um, has uh, a, a population of 28%. And as 67,500 people identify as members of Presbyterian Church of Vanuatu. The head office of the Presbyterian Church of Vanuatu is located in Port Vila. The Presbyterian Church of Vanuatu has nine presbyteries across four of the six provinces of Vanuatu. Balampa Province, Sanma Province, 
Shepherd Province, Natafia Province. The Brazilian Women Missionary Union, the Women's Fellowship are active in the churches. They are organized and they span from the leadership level to community congregations and often across widespread islands and they are accountable to their members. In partnership with these women's organizations, space and avenue is open to enable women to make the decisions and lead the community development within their own communities, including how to engage with men and the often very male leadership of the church. The church is deeply rooted within Vanuatu culture and society and all significant power within families and communities. Churches are powerful institutions across the Pacific. They are central to family and community and Pacific church leaders a highly influential role in guiding people's behavior and actions. What they preach becomes lives, reality, and their policies, and theologies often reinforce social stereotypes and norms. Members of parliaments are members of a church. Police, army, everybody in Vanuatu are members of churches. Churches are al already structured, wide, spread networks, but also access to the underlying belief system that underpin, underpin many of the entrenched attitudes and inequality that can pe perpetuate the violent and discriminative behaviors often seen within the Pacific. And as many um, NGOs and development agencies will attest, churches can sometimes be seen as more of a barrier to attitude change than agents of transformation. And churches can be viewed as gatekeepers and ob obstacles to overcome and, and institutions to start, sidestep. Um, and as we've heard frequently um, cited, one of the biggest challenges in the promotion of gender equality and barriers towards making progress in the elimination of violence against women and girls is people using Bible verses inappropriately. And speaking to how in situations of domestic and family violence in communities, church leaders are commonly the first point of help. The response of the church leaders, overwhelmingly male in the Pacific, is based on theological understandings of marriage and perceived natural, natural gender roles, theologies of forgive and forget, wifely submission, and a prayerful response are traditionally common. Human rights is not a familiar concept in Pacific language, but there, that there is support for the concept itself once framed into biblical terms. We can attempt to change how we behave. However, if this change does not match our values and belief system, then the change will be temporarily at best. In a context where there is a communal approach to identify and life, individual human rights and human rights based language seems foreign and imposed and is often seen as an attack on faith and culture. In the light of this, perceived attack on culture and faith, Pacific Church have attempted to resist protection, laws and rights-based concepts, clinging tighter, their biblical interpretations around relationship, family life, and God's perceived way and law. In 2012 and 13, Uniting World undertook a journey of learning and listening to and learning from the women of partner churches across the Pacific. And distilled down, the take home message was this, if violence towards women and girls in the Pacific is to change, we must engage with churches, with their leadership, their theology, their policies and their practices and their preaching. For if what's preached into the community on a Sunday and what's learnt in weekly Bible studies doesn't communicate gender equality, then no amount of workshops focused on human rights and behaviour change will make any difference. So Uniting World in 2013 and 14 used this knowledge and based on this advice and supported the women's fellowships across the Pacific to pilot gender projects. Um, two Pacific theologians, Reverend Dr. Cliff Bird and Reverend Dr. Seth Rosa Carroll developed a range of biblical theological resources and implemented them widely through, through the region in these pilot projects. And it was from this learning and ongoing consultation that Uniting World's Partnering Women for Change program was developed. 
It rests on the critical assumption that it is impossible to achieve sustainable and lasting change without engaging authentically with the deep-seated Christian faith and belief systems of Pacific Islander churches. And it works at all levels of the church and community, through the church themselves, through their own structures. It's a church-owned program and led by women's fellowships. So in 2016, Gender Equality Theology, or GET, resources were produced. And these are a suite of biblical theological resources, which engage churches across the Pacific at all levels, from leadership and theological training to community groups and youth and Sunday schools. The framework paper provides an overall biblical theological foundation for human dignity and gender equality, breaking the Bible down to the context and authorship in writing, extracting the message and reflecting and reinterpreting. And this framework has a whole of Bible approach and enables churches to take ownership, which we'll hear more from later for PCV. The Bible studies um, both contain five short guided and supported Bible studies from the framework paper and enable churches to grapple with the concepts within their own context and experience. They're ecumenical in nature and don't adhere to any specific denominational doctrine. Reframing the human rights concept using a, a biblical language of human dignity afforded all people as created equally in the image of God. Enables churches to engage with human rights concepts from within the church, cultural and faith. Introduced to tools for biblical interpretations as guide to reader, to reflect first on cultural context, language and voice in which books chapters and passages of the Bible were written before seeking to extract and apply a message to today. Church leaders have re-examined the Bible from within the culture and context it was written to and learn destructive interpretations that oppress women and even justify violence that supports harsh treatment on children and all people with disability as less and to rediscover the equality and justice message running throughout the entire of the Bible. The PCV has demonstrated active and public embrace of GET concept. This supports the suggestion that stimulating church-wide embrace of these concepts in heavily hated by having a group of leaders advocating for change, rather than just one or two leaders attempting to influence a much larger majority to embrace change. The PCV Christian Education Department valued the theology of gender equality and since 2017 has produced resources in relation to gender relationships. PCV is now witnessing an increase of number of women, clergy and elders. More ministers are accepting get and encourage women into leadership and, and leadership roles and participate in decision making. Last year, in 2018, during the 16 days of activism, the PCV and DCC uh, participate in advocating during the 16 days of activism in six communities in Port Vila. And we're just going to share a video to show you um, some of the impact within the Presbyterian Church in Vanuatu. My name is Pastor Nibi Hayong. I come from Efate. I live in Bortfila, the capital city of uh, Vanuatu. And uh, I am the Presbytery Clerk of South Nevada Presbytery responsible for the administration uh, work of the South Nevada Presbytery and the Presbyterian Church of Vanuatu. Many people in uh, Vanuatu and uh, many people in my presbytery, church leaders, uh, local people, they do not really know about gender balance. Uh, and what I'm doing now at the moment is to try and produce materials that will be very easy to understand, to be given out to the local congregations, and uh, to make them aware that 
there is this topic of gender balance. In Vanuatu, there is no gender balance. You know, people live traditionally, culturally, the, the, the man is always the boss. There is nothing to do with the women. And I never, never knew what is gender balance in relation to the Bible. So that's we talked and I made my studies and I studied the Bible. I, then we realized that, yeah, there is something there. And I continued to make my research. Now it has sort of infected me. I like it. <laughs> Work together. We share the information about Bible studies, gender balance, and now we could improve uh, all theological issues uh, affecting uh, Vanuatu and the Pacific Islands. And these studies have gone out to the village, the local congregation. They went along to the media, Radio Vanuatu, uh, the newspaper and television to talk about uh, gender balance and uh, what the Bible says about uh, gender balance. And it has stirred up many interests. I produced these materials and so okay. Uh, we never thought that men and women could be related, could be in equal terms. And uh, it has created in me also the passion for writing more studies in different areas. There are some places in the Bible that uh, I never thought that it talks about balance, men and women. But as I do my studies, I related to the sessions, the congregation. Some of them don't even believe that this is about gender balance. But as they, they study the notes, they realize that yes, there's something in the Bible that we have to dig deeper and find out that there is something there to teach us about our relationship. Without studying the notes, they made the comments. But once they, they look at the notes and study it and pray over it, they say, oh yeah, there's something there that talks about the women, the men, together uh, in the suffering and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The studies are distributed to all the congregations, not only the Presbyterians, so I'm a Presbyterian pastor, but the other churches are also interested in it. Now, you must know that in one or two, uh, the other churches, they do not accept uh, women to be church leaders. But once the study reaches them, they, they looked at it, they studied it, and now they're accepting uh, women to become pastors, women to become lecturers, women to be, become deacons and elders. I've got feedback from the village, way back in the mountains or remote areas, that they're doing it, they're reading it, because it's in simple English and simple Pislama language. So I would say that it's the wider audience of the population of Vanuatu. I have been elected as the new Christian Education Director. And this is the exact right position for me to produce these materials and to send it out. The Bible studies will be widely distributed, not only in Vanuatu, but as far as Numea, the church is issuing and taking it, this subject very seriously and uh, the changes are beginning to happen. Sorry. <laughs> Um, as well as um, Uniting World working with our church partners, um, we and they have also been working ecumenically and such as with AOA and ARCOM, as you've heard. But also um, we found that non-faith-based CSOs recognize the core value of the theological foundation when working in the Pacific and are requested to work collaboratively and in partnership. Um, and by situating um, human rights as a shared concern with other rights organisations, churches can open dialogue and partner with those groups to better support and empower women um, and feed into the work of secular rights based organisations working in the region for increased effectiveness. Um, for example, 
male church leaders um, at the Methodist Church in Fiji had um, a successful encounter with the Fiji Women's Crisis Centre as they came together to improve their responses to church women who, who experienced violence. Three men openly professed that if the GET session, the gender equality theology session, hadn't taken place earlier, they would have resisted the advocacy during the Fiji Women's Crisis Centre session. <clears throat> The Vermont Women's Center has worked collaboratively with the Presbyterian Women's Fellowship in leading GET and ending violence against women and girls' activities within the Presbyterian Church. The Presbyterian Women's Fellowship also works collaboratively with the Vanuatu Council of Churches and has facilitated GET training with the Vanuatu Council of Churches. The modelling of equal gender relationships during workshops is also seen to be a significant feature for affecting change both in women and men's behaviour and attitudes. Most often workshops are co-facilitated by females and males and sometimes a married couple and the evidence suggests that this has been important in ensuring that the advocacy by male church leaders in pursuing gender equality doesn't reinforce the stereotypical gender norms and diminish the ability of women, for women themselves to lead and be heard. Modeling husband and wife relationship was a primary focus as a testimony and evidence of God's vision for human relationship, that particularly showing a change of male's attitude, bringing transformation that shows respect, honor and love to his close neighbor, his wife and partner in God's mission reflecting an healthy relationship and both enjoying the fullness of life. Many more of the, these stories of change are related to male participants adopting greater responsibility for us all cause. And why this is important, recognizing that women's low status, the imbalance of power and rigid gender roles and stereotypes, construction, constructions of masculinity and femininity a root causes of violence against women. The reinterpretation of the Bible increased numbers of church ministers to become agents of change and empowered and advocating and influenced other male leaders to be agents of change as well. They are also empowering their wife and their children. To conclude, the lesson learned during the, this journey, first we learned that the language, language must be used, must be appropriate to the, to the context. The second lesson learned is the agent of change. We have to target people with influence, especially church leaders, ministers, who then become agent of change and model the healthy relationship. The third thing that we learned on this journey is the community of practice. Through agent of change, they are building a community of practice. We also learn to, uh, the importance to equip, to equip up, uh, to equip up some leaders in get get us to be taught in Bible colleges. And also, lastly, we also learn to continue to build a community of practice is to get get us to be taught to youths and also Sunday school. Thank you. Thank you, Martha and Natasha. We will now turn to our shared conclusion. <clears throat> According to data compiled by the inaugural SDG Gender Index, which measures progress against the SDGs, no country in the world is on track to achieve gender equality by 2030. The index has found that the world is furthest behind on gender equality issues relating to, among others, worryingly, the standalone gender equality goal, SDG 5, which includes the target on eliminating violence against women and girls in the public and private spheres. While investments to end violence against women and girls are limited, it is also important to note that legal and policy frameworks and commitments focused on ending gender-based violence are gradually improving at national levels, and many donors are honing a focus on ending violence against women, including in our region, reinforced by the OECD that now tracks a targeting ending violence against women.
in this larger context, we wanted to conclude with some considerations for future project and program designs targeting gender-based violence. These are drawn from lessons gathered in the ongoing faith-based approaches highlighted today. First, <clears throat> invest time in, in, de in developing genuine relationships with churches and faith leaders. Across the region, as we have heard, the church is a cornerstone of people's daily lives. Faith leaders are highly trusted and influential and biblical theology and faith language are a known and acceptable framework for understanding human rights. Designs ought to be based on a sound understanding of churches, including their hierarchies, and an acknowledgement and appreciation of the expertise and wisdom of local faith leaders. If local faith actors do not have ownership of gender-based violence prevention efforts, neither will communities. Second, be responsive, be responsive and flexible to variations among churches and faith communities. While the majority of communities in the Pacific region identify as Christian, there are important variations across and within denominations that require understanding and consideration for programming. Project designs engaging with faith-based actors and communities need to understand and be responsive and flexible toward geographical and denominational variations and nuances in the Pacific. Third, in contexts with limited or non-existent formal services, identify avenues to support and link to faith leaders to ensure women's safety is prioritized. As we have heard, faith leaders are trusted by communities for their domestic conflict resolution. They are often informal service providers themselves and often exist in contexts with limited or non-existent formal services for survivors of gender-based violence. In these contexts, our programming has indicated the importance of identifying avenues to support and link to faith leaders to ensure women's rights and safety are prioritized and to ensure awareness of available service providers. To keep Critically reflecting and learning, some questions for all of us to consider are, what is the most effective and impactful way to support church leaders to reduce gender-based violence, both within their churches and congregations and outside? How can we ensure ongoing complementarity between churches and international actors to tackle gender-based violence? And how can we listen better and ask relevant questions to improve meaningful conversations with local faith actors? Oh, apologies. Sorry about that. <laughs> My apologies, that was very unspooth. Um, so that is the end of our presentations. Um, we now have a bit of time for Q&A before concluding the webinar. Um, as we begin the Q&A portion of the webinar, just a reminder that if you want to see the questions uh, that have been raised, you please click on the Q&A button. Um, that's on your control panel. Okay. Panelists, can you all hear? Uh, so we have a number of questions that have come through um, and I will uh, start uh, in which the order that they uh, were typed. Um, the first was, um, that came through uh, when Belinda was speaking, and perhaps Belinda, you can start by answering this question. How does the church leadership training deal with what are considered taboo topics? Um, I'm actually going to throw this question to Millie and World Vision Vanuatu, simply because the project that uh, we mentioned that we will be utilizing in our ANCP project is the World Vision Vanuatu Channels of Hope slash reach program. So I will get Millie, who's the expert in the actual program to answer that. No problem. Um, 
it's it's really difficult and a touchy subject to address taboo topics um, and world vision. We can probably give two examples of how we do that. One, uh, by talking about sexual respect and sexual violence, which is a very big taboo topic here, uh, and also LGBTIQ+. Um, I think briefly to talk about sexual respect has been a very slow process with our faith leaders um, and was there was initially quite a lot of, of backlash against talking about it because it is not something that faith leaders are uh, trained to speak on. Um, and Pastor Fiamma, do you want to speak about how we, we embedded that sexual respect into the men's behaviour change content? Yes, within, um, within the channel of all training, uh, there is an exercise where um, we call it inside the box and outside the box where we, we put everybody that accepted within the box and others that we, we, la we label them as outside the box and uh, look at questions how we, we apply the Christian principles of love and acceptance, that we love everybody, we accept everybody in spite of what they do and allow them to choose um, what change they can, uh, they can uh, come across in life. Mm. That was specifically, well, really important for talking about LGBTIQ+, which is a real taboo topic here. Um, and we basically go through the Bible uh, and teach proper biblical principles around the life of Christ and his teaching, which is uh, through love and yeah. acceptance. Um, sexual respect has been really difficult to address and it's been a really slow process. Um, going through bit by bit uh, and not too fast to ensure that faith leaders come with us along that journey so that they're actually able to start talking about that in their communities, not just preaching and teaching, but also facilitating discussions around sexual respect. I hope that answers your question, but Natasha might have a little bit more to add around LGBTIQ+. Um, I think just to um, yeah add that um, we found that through using the theological approach, um, a number of church partners have you know begun discussions on previously unwelcome subjects. Um, it it kind of provides a space to to have those discussions, and so churches are definitely having them. Um, and basically, the the get. Um, because it, the conversations are based around the theological foundation um, and engaging biblical questioning and debates um, and testing, the conversations are based on um, the, any biblical interpretation that causes harm or oppression or violence um, to any person who's contrary to the person um, and teaching of Jesus and needs to be re-examined. So that's kind of how Theologians and churches and leadership and pastors are engaging in the topics and, and using the Bible. Thank you very much. Um, another question that came through that would um, be useful for everyone to answer. Um, how do you deal with sexual exploitation and abuse and harassment in your projects, but also within your own organizations, particularly when dealing with gender-based violence projects? Um, Belinda, would you like to go first? Sure. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, so obviously this is a space that's um, growing in momentum at the moment, not just for our partners, but for ourselves as well, in terms of um, improving our own safeguards and policies and procedures um, in the prevention of sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment. Um, so we're on that journey at the moment. Um, as, a, as an Australian faith-based organisation, and we're about to, well, we have already engaged with our partners um, to, to accompany them on this journey as well. So for us, in terms of how we approach this with our partners, um, initially it's through soft entry points. So recent monitoring visits, we start bringing up the topic, what do these words mean? Um, we start including them in uh, reports that we have that we collaboratively write with partners um, through training materials that we're going to provide to partners. Um, we are uh, starting with the training actually in Solomon Islands in a few weeks with the heads of the Anglican Church of Melanesia and the headquarters of that is in Honiara and Solomon Islands. So there'll be the head, heads of the church 
um, and hopefully the Archbishop there as well. And so we're really aiming at the very top of the church to socialize um, PSEAH um, and looking at the root causes as well in terms of power differentiations and, and gender-based violence as well. So we're very much at the start of that journey um, and we're very much going to continue to support um, our partners as we venture on this journey as well. So for us at the moment, it's about um, exploring what these terms mean, um, very much in a theological approach as well. So the training I just mentioned, that is going to be delivered in a theological approach, similar to um, how the Theology of Gender and the REACH Channels of Hope program were described as well, using biblical passages. The same has been um, embedded within that training as well. I hope that answers the question. Uh, Millie or Natasha, do either of you want to add anything? Sure. Um, just briefly for Wellington Vanuatu, uh, we work um, a lot with staff on capacity building and training. We have a, an annual L&D learning and development calendar. Um, and a key part of that is our safeguarding work. So comprehensive training to all staff annually on safeguarding both of children, um, people with disabilities and other community members, as well as themselves. So we have strong policies around behaviour protocols in communities and when conducting field work, um, as well as guidelines on how to be safe in the field for staff safety. We have um, World Vision Vanuatu has three program offices, one in Port Villa, one in Espiritu Santo, and one in Tana. And all three of those offices have dedicated safeguarding uh, staff, which other staff can go to, to either make a report of something that they've witnessed in the community, or something that they've witnessed of another staff member, or something that's occurred to them themselves. But we also have a structure where if they would prefer to refer or report to someone else, they are able to do so. And we're very lucky to have Pastor Fiala on our team who offers pastoral care to all our staff if they so wish to take it up. Um, and just to, yeah, I don't want to go too much further, but very similarly to um, especially AOA, um, but we, the theological approach to that and um, values-based conversations rather than compliance and using kind of words which, um, you know, uh, potentially a bit of a barrier. So very much about values-based conversations and working together collaboratively. Um, we, as requested, we support partners towards policy um, development and that's actually part of the um, Partnering Women for Change program um, is that the, with the Freemans Fellowship um, lead those conversations and the kind of theological focal point um, drive that those those processes. And I, I just wanted to add to that um, the the consortium can do that I mentioned during the presentation. So we're very much the as well at least for eight Australian NGOs that work um, in the Pacific. We are I suppose taking quite an ecumenical approach um, and working collaboratively through a safeguarding working group, and that includes Uniting World as well. So we very much share and learn and leverage off one another um, and look at what's working well and what's not. Um, and it's quite an effective sharing space for each of the organizations involved. <clears throat> Thanks. Now we don't have a, we're, we're, we've kind of run over a little bit, but I did want to pose a different question. We've got some wonderful questions coming in, but um, one of our participants has asked, what contribution, if any, can Australian based researchers make to support your work? Who wants to begin that one? Millie? Oh, Belinda, go ahead. Yeah, um, so I think, well, I mean, a, a great deal. <laughs> um, definitely engaging with, um, as a start, engaging with us as, as faith-based organisations um, and then engaging with our church partners but to be able to have especially um you know i speak 
as a staff member of AOA, we're quite a small organization. So to be able to leverage off some really rich data um, and research and reports that academics um, may have the resources to do would be very beneficial for us um, to be able to learn from, from that research that we perhaps might not have the means to do. So um, we are um, very much open um, to academics who want <coughs> to dive into this space um, and able to do the research and have the means to carry out that research that we would love to do, but just don't have the resources to do. And I think that data and that evaluation, the evidence that comes through um, academics work would be of great benefit to our programs um, and be able to really strengthen and be able to learn quite a lot from that. Thanks, and Adasha, I think you were gonna respond. Do you wanna respond and then we'll move on to another question? Yeah, just quickly, the, um, yeah, similarly that we, we do um, involve researchers and we've actually part of our gender equality theology um, institutional transformation program funded by Pacific Women. Um, part of that in this next financial year is doing some research. Um, but again, we also want to um, incorporate um, Australian-based researchers, but also Pacific Island researchers. Um, and so perhaps working together if there was um, research involved. Thanks. Now we've had a, a few questions, um, participants who are interested to know um, if any of the materials, the training materials from REACH and, um, and GET are available to other organizations and churches? So for the gender equality theology resources, um, that's all available on our website. Um, we'll be sharing, I'll share the link to that, um, we'll share afterwards, but that's available on our website for anyone to access. Um, and I know that people have asked about, we, we also um, welcome people talking to us about them um, and requesting training um, through the CAN network. We've, we've done a lot of um, ecumenical work that way, but also um, for other NGOs as well. So we're happy to open that dialogue. We've also shared um, our resources. They're not, open, they're not online uh, as yet. However, we have uh, shared in the past with other organisations and other World Vision um, offices. Um, just noting though that the World Vision Vanuatu REACH resources are very contextual to Vanuatu and for any other location that need to be uh, recontextualised, which uh, we put a lot of work into and we would recommend that that kind of process would ha have to happen again for any other location. Yeah, and I think to just, um, yeah, the, the gender equality theology resources are very Pacific um, based. They're written by Pacific theologians. Um, so outside of the Pacific, they might not be so um, relevant. Thanks. Now, maybe we'll do uh, one more question before, um, before closing. Um, there's a question coming from one participant around modeling relationships, and she's um, wondering how, um, how you manage the challenges of working with strongly hierarchical churches with resistance to self-reflection and change. Um, Natasha, would you like to answer this one? Um, so as I said, Uniting World, we work predominantly with our partners um, and our partners are based on a long, a long history, um, a reciprocal relationship. And also um, these conversations are being had by Pacific theologians, um, and also the, the program that United and World work with the PCV and our other church partners is that they are, it is church ownership. So the churches are engaging and leading it themselves. So I guess that's the, because we're not coming in as an external um, organization, it's, it's not something that we have to consider as such through this program, but we do have that with our different partners. Um, different partners are at different um, kind of stages and some are more willing um, and more open and wanting and um, engaging and debating in this, in this kind of sphere than others. So we work to that. Thanks, Natasha. Um, did um, any of our local partners want to uh, reflect on any of the questions that have been asked before we, before we finish up? I think we're all good here. Okay. 
So that is it for us in this webinar. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Um, if you have any more questions, or there were some questions that sadly we weren't able to get to, um, you, are, you are welcome to reach out to the panelists directly. Um, so their contact details will be in the PowerPoint slides that are going to be shared afterwards. Um, thank you to the panelists, Ethel George and Belinda Loria, Pastor Fiamma Rakao and Millie Greaves and Martha Kalwitman and Natasha Holland. Thank you also to ACFID for hosting the webinar and to Vicky Wong for her assistance. Um, we will be sharing uh, the recording of this webinar, our PowerPoints, links to videos, and also relevant reference material by email afterwards. If you have a few minutes, I know we've run, out of, run over time slightly, but if you have a few minutes, um, we would ask that you please complete a quick ACFID survey um, to collect your feedback on the webinar uh, when the webinar finishes. So you'll be re redirected to a new page for this purpose. Um, thank you very much for joining us uh, and goodbye.